and Brother Jackson and uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and if there are those here tonight and I believe there are some who are not of the fellowship that are represented by the debaters here tonight we, we thank you especially for coming for this occasion and as you uh, examine what is said during this time we, we bid you not to view us as people that are opposed to each other but as people that have varying views of the kingdom of God both brother Hires and myself are quite serious in our position uh, we serve the Lord with as with a clear conscience and uh, we commend that to you now I'm with you tonight in fear and in trembling not because I have undue concern about my position not because I am fearful of brother Hires not because I'm fearful of the rejection of you, the audience, but because I feel the gravity of the situation as each one of us represents the mind of God as we perceive it to you, the audience. While it may appear as though I am on trial or Brother Hires is upon trial, it is God and his word our perception of it shall I say that is on trial tonight and for that reason I make these preliminary remarks we are fulfilling the apostolic injunction of 1st Corinthians 14 29 where those who speak publicly to the body of Christ submit themselves to the judgment of their brethren and not only am I submitting tonight to the judgment of Brother Hires and Brother Hires to mine, but we are both, without reservation, and I believe I speak for us both here, submitting our words to your judgment and evaluation. You must have the last word in this debate. In view of that, I admonish that both of us uh, refrain from undue references to the commandments and traditions of men, we have, uh, for whatever reason, had a prolific number of references to men's quotations here during the debate. And while we respect and honor the men who have made those quotations, I suggest that we confine ourselves as much as possible to the word of the Lord and to our personal observations of and perceptions of the, the kingdom of God. Now I have pers I know that there have been personally several men referred to here, including Brother DeWelt, Brother Dunning, Brother Fred Blakely, uh, Brother Julian Hunt, Brother Tom Warren. Now I can speak for at least four of these men that they are zealous that uh, we not try and establish your thoughts about this subject upon their perception. And I speak in their behalf as well as in my own. It's very important to me as a speaker and as someone that has embraced a position that I do not anchor your hope upon what another has said, no matter how godly they may be. Now, I count myself fortunate to stand before this distinguished gathering of men, men of God and women of God, expert in all scripture and manners and customs of the restoration movement, to give an account for my use of musical instruments in the praise of God. I want to provide for you a background that is dictating the position I am taking before I get underway, chart number 84. I am proceeding upon this foundation that the preeminent thing in the kingdom of God is the knowledge of God. These questions that I ask, I am not necessarily directing to brother hires he is under no obligation to answer these questions now I will preface what I'm going to say by explaining why I've said that I understand that our perceptions of questions may differ dramatically so a person is under no obligation to respond to my questions unless they have perceived the direction I'm coming from so you're at perfect liberty brother hires to, re to respond or not that is your at your discretion so I ask this question if uh, not of you of myself is the worship of God or the knowledge of God preeminent? And I affirm that the knowledge of God is the preeminent issue. 
and that I am approaching this subject with the knowledge of God rather than the worship of God in mind. I am maintaining that the knowledge of God, the personal knowledge of God through our Lord Jesus Christ cannot be reduced to a mere legal system, that it cannot be legislated, that it is a matter of the heart, and that this is the preeminent thing that is desired of God. As Isaiah said in Isaiah 53 and 11, speaking for God's righteous servant, his righteous servant by his knowledge shall justify many. So the absolute acquittal of men from sin has been by the holy prophet associated with the knowledge, the personal, intimate knowledge of the Almighty God. God further said through Hosea that he desired the knowledge of God above burnt offerings, that even above offering God something, God earnestly desires to be known and to be comprehended. As he said to Jeremiah the prophet, the wise man is not to glory in his wisdom, and the mighty man is not to glory in his might, and the rich man is not to glory in his riches. But he that glorieth, let him glory in this, that he knoweth me, and understandeth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness. I am bringing the question of instrumental music to bear upon the knowledge of God. And to fortify the gravity of that statement, I give to you the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to in a definition of eternal life that staggers the mind and challenges the heart. He said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Chart 85, please. <clears throat> now, as we think about the knowledge of God, we have affirmed throughout this debate that the Worship of God cannot be regulated. Now, I pose this question. Does a person that knows the Lord need to be instructed on how to worship him in spirit and in truth? And if so, then in what sense, if any at all, is the Lord known? Chart number 86. <clears throat> Again, I'm laying the foundation for why I'm taking the approach I'm taking which admittedly is a bit different than perhaps some are accustomed to. Is the use of a musical instrument in the praise of God incompatible with the knowledge of God? That is the question that I am going to address. And if it is, in what sense is it? I am not addressing the matter of whether it is uh, authorized or not. It's whether it blends in with the preeminent matter, the knowledge of God. <clears throat> Now, once again stated, my proposition is this, chart number 94. The employment of instruments of music in the singing of praise does not transgress the law of God, is harmonious with the faith of Christ, and is inoffensive to God. Hence, it is scriptural and in harmony with the word of God. Now permit me to define the various statements found in this proposition. By the employment of instruments of music, I refer to man's use of musical instruments as a means of expressing his heart to God, where he employs them to actually extend his own personality and to work out an expression that is from within. By musical instruments, I refer to things with, as Paul calls it, no life-giving sound. Instruments that of themselves can be neither profitable nor harmful. Their blessing or their curse is found in their use by man. By singing of praise, I refer to the expression of an individual's heart which has resulted from the spiritual illumination that comes from an exposure to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an expression that is prompted by faith. It is an expression of discernment and a thankful spirit. By does not transgress the law of God, I mean that the employment of musical instruments in the praise of God do not extend beyond the moral code given by God to define sin, given by God to stop the mouth of every man and to produce universal guilt. Chart number 52. I think it's necessary for me to refer, refer uh, more definitively to the law of God. 
This is the law that came by Moses. The law was given by Moses, John 1, 17. That's the law that I'm talking about. By the law, Romans 3, 20 says, is the knowledge of sin. That's the law that I'm talking about. This is the law we know, that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth might be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. That's the law that I'm talking about. This is the law referred to in Galatians, the third chapter and verse 13, that Jesus Christ has delivered us from the curse of the law. That's the law that I'm talking about. This is the law referred to in Romans, the fourth chapter and verse, four, uh, verse 15. We know that the law worketh wrath. That's the law that I'm talking about. It's the law that was given, according to Romans 5 and verse 20, that the offense might abound. Now, the employment of musical instruments in the praise of God does not, I am affirming, transgress that law. It is also harmonious with the faith of Christ. That is an expression taken from the King James Version, which means faith in Christ. By faith in Christ, or the faith of Christ, as the proposition states, I mean the assurance that the record God has given of his Son is true, and that it's applicable to me. That when Jesus Christ died, he died for me. I perceive he died for me. I embrace the fact that he died for me, and promptly obey the word of the truth of the gospel. The persuasion of unseen realities that are proclaimed in God's word constitutes the sub and substance that I embrace. Thus, faith becomes the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The use of musical instruments does not, I am affirming, inhibit or conflict with faith. The persuasion that Christ's vicarious death and sacrifice applies personally to me. Now, the last phrase, uh, that it is inoffensive to God. That is to say that we have no indication in Scripture, and I am confining myself to Scripture. I am not interested in man's observations of what they think the Scripture means. In Scripture, we have no indication that God is or ever has been offended or repulsed by the righteous expressing themselves to him on musical instruments. Once again, I am affirming that it is impossible for something to be sinful that does not transgress God's law, that is harmonious with faith, or is inoffensive to God. Chart number 95. I'm repeatedly setting this before you because I want you to understand completely where I'm going. The use of instrumental music, three different perspectives that I am providing. The conclusion of which will be that its use cannot be sinful. It does not transgress the law of God. It is in harmony with the faith of Christ, and it does not offend God, or as the proposition states, is inoffensive to God. Thus, it is scriptural and in harmony with the word of God. Chart number 97, please. <clears throat> Let me look at this from another vantage point. The use of instrumental music does not transgress the law of God, is in harmony with the faith of Christ, and does not offend God. Sin, I am considering as an expression of the human nature, as an actual expression, whether by deed or thought or word, an expression of man's nature. I am saying that for something to be offensive to God, it is something that alienates from him. Now, an example of something offensive to God, but may not be specifically articulated as a transgression in Scripture, is the ignorance of God. The Word of God tells us in Ephesians 4.18 that we are alienated from God through the ignorance that is in him. There is something offensive to God. I'm maintaining that the use of instrumental music in praise to God does not fall in that category of things that are offensive to God. 
Uh, something that is not harmonious with the faith is something that competes with it, something that inhibits a person's faith, something that makes it more difficult to appropriate the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, something that drops justification away from the heart of man, something that pushes God at a distance from man, that makes the word of God inaccessible to man. Now, an example of that would be the cares of this world. They are not of faith, and those that choke out the word of God and compete with this glorious knowledge of God. An example of the transgression of the law, which I am addressing at this present time, would be adultery, what was an express breaking of one of the commandments of God. It violated the verbal revelation of Almighty God. Now let's get into this, uh, to this proposition. <clears throat> the use of instrumental music does not transgress the law of God. The thought of transgression is an intriguing one. And for someone interested in God, I know that they are interested in not transgressing the Lord. To transgress means to go aside, to go beyond. It's a breach of the law. The idea is here it extends into an area where God does not reside, where the blessing of God does not reside, into an area that is antithetical to God, opposite to God, voids the person's contact with God, that from God, that puts one in a position where there cannot possibly be harmony or compatibility with God. Now the word of the Lord talks about men transgressing the commandment in Numbers the 14th chapter in verse 41. He said, do not ye now transgress the commandment. It also speaks of transgressing the covenant, which is a much broader thing than just the commandment that's found in Joshua the seventh chapter and verses 11 and 15 they have also transgressed my covenant I'm showing here the enormity of the word transgress they also are said to transgress against God in first chronicles 5 and verse 25 they transgress against the God of their father and again in second chronicles chapter 26 and verse 16 we read that they transgressed against the Lord the one who was over them a God in one dramatic lament of his people departing from him said they have transgressed against me in Isaiah 23 27 and finally in Isaiah 24 and verse 5 he said they have transgressed the Lord now what do we gain from all of this we learn from this that the transgression of the law actually involves a transgression against God's nature. For the law was a reflection of God himself. Chart number 51. <clears throat> it's important that you, whether you agree with what I'm saying or not, that you comprehend as much as possible what I'm saying here. The law was a moral code, that is a code that dealt with right and wrong, a moral code that reflected divine character. As the words of the covenant, which it is called in Deuteronomy, it presented man with the opportunity to achieve righteousness and thus obtain life. This do and live was the promise. It was another way of saying, be like me. For the law was the nature of God compressed into ten succinct statements and written with the finger of God upon tablets of stone. Romans the 10th chapter in verse 5, commenting on the righteousness of the law, goes back to that moral picture of God, the words of the covenant, the law of God, and said, The man which doeth these things shall live by this. Why? Because he would have demonstrated that he was exactly like God. Of course, those of you familiar with Scripture understand that it fails miserably because the law was weak to the flesh. It was much like a, much like a steam engine in which a person tried to drive a steam engine with a cardboard boiler. The steam would be weak to that cardboard boiler. Now the law was good, and it was righteous, and it was spiritual, and it was holy. The Word of God tells us this. But it was weak because man did not have the capacity to perform it. Law cannot be divorced. The law of God, let me be more precise. 
The law of God cannot be divorced from God himself. A transgression of the law is a transgression against God's nature. Now we know this is the case because 1 Peter 1.16, Peter refers to this sort of righteousness and he says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God then is calling upon man to mirror his own character, if you please, in the law. The transgression of the law is a transgression of what was said, not what was not said. That is to say it was to veer from the objective of God. The purpose of the law, speaking from the standpoint of mankind, was to restrain the flesh, to keep flesh, the Adamic nature, from expressing itself against God. You will observe that all of the thou shalt not had to do with the, with the flesh. None of them had to do with restraint Godward. Now, it's very important that you see this. Even in the law of God, men were not restrained Godward. They were restrained fleshward. All of the thou shalt not didn't have to do with coming to God. Nobody was told, thou shalt not sing, thou shalt not shout, thou shalt not clap, thou shalt not, or whatever you want to add. It all had to do with the flesh. You shall not lie, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. It all had to do with restraint upon the flesh. <clears throat> Summarizing the law to demonstrate that, now my proposition is that the use of instrumental music does not transgress this law that I'm talking about. To summarize the law and demonstrate that there was no restraint Godward, the law said in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter and verse five, something familiar I'm sure to all of you, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. No restraint. When you come to me, there is to be no restraint. All your heart all your mind, all your strength. Restraint toward God, and I am careful to say I am speaking of toward God alone, restraint toward God is out of harmony with grace and truth. <clears throat> the law of God, chart number 53, please. Because uh, I think that some of us perhaps do not have the proper respect for the law of God, and I do not speak that, believe me, to the deprecation of anyone, for I myself uh, was after that manner, did not realize the, the glory of the law of God. Romans 2 and verse 20 said it contained a form of knowledge and of the truth, the law did. It said in Romans the third chapter and verse 21 that the law witnessed to the righteousness of God. Romans the seventh chapter and verse 12 tells us that the law is good, the commandment holy and just and good. Romans 7 verse 14 tells us that we know that the law is spiritual. <clears throat> now sin is the transgression of that law, as I want to demonstrate later. Now may I say, it is passingly interesting that the man most noted for extolling the law of God was a sweet psalmist that did so quite frequently with instrumental music. This is inconceivable that such a thing could come to pass if it violated or transgressed the law which he himself was extolling. Jesus died for the transgressions that were under the First Testament. If using musical instruments in praise to God, in fact, transgresses the law, Jesus died, Hebrews 9, 15 tells us, for the transgression that were under the First Testament, which means he would have died for those sins involved in playing musical instruments to him, those with just a modicum of understanding about the scriptures would not wish to affirm such a position. Thank you. Me now to change my position from the affirmative to the negative. 
The first two nights, it was my position to affirm. Uh, the last two evenings of this debate, it is my position to deny. And I deny with all of the fiber of my being and all of the conviction of my soul the proposition that has been read in your hearing tonight. I am grateful for the opportunity. I'm thankful to the church here at Hillcrest for providing the opportunity, and I appreciate so much the presence and the interest of each one of you. I want to emphasize again that the differences between us are not personal. Nothing at all that I have against uh, Brother Blakely would have brought me here. I never met him before. I have not known him. I've had nothing against him. I have nothing against him now. I do not have anything against any of these other brethren who agree with him or those whom I've quoted. And we're not here because of any personal disputation at all. It is because of the sacred principles that are involved in our discussion this evening. We will press our points with fervor. I've endeavored to do that in the first two evenings in my affirmation, but that again is as a matter of principle. We genuinely believe the principles involved. Some of the principles that I have endeavored to enunciate in this debate, first, that we believe that the scriptures are the divinely inspired word of God, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Secondly, that they are given to guide and direct us in living the Christian life and being acceptable unto God. Hebrews 11, 6, Romans 10, 17. Third, that we must have divine authority for what we teach and practice. And I elaborated upon that in some detail in the chart on the authority of Christ in the first two evenings of this discussion. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Four, we do not believe that instrumental music is divinely authorized in the worship of the New Testament church. And that is the basic issue between us, as well as the question of authority. Now, there are some things that we've learned in this debate already thus far. We have learned that Brother Blakely does not believe that there are any regulations for worship in the New Testament. He's argued that now for the first two evenings. I don't believe that he'll go back on that this evening, even though I think that he may argue somewhat inconsistently with his own principles before he is through with his affirmative. But he has told us that there are no regulations. And I pointed out that this uh, is different from what his brethren have argued in the past. In the past, his brethren have argued uh, in debate that instrumental music is authorized in worship. If it is authorized, of course, that means there has been some regulation. There has been some detail. That has been set forth in the Word of God. And I think one reason that he emphasized at the beginning tonight that he did not want us to quote from men is because I have shown that difference between him and those who have preceded him in the efforts that he's making tonight. He has utterly repudiated the efforts of those who have gone before him. And I believe that I have a perfect and legitimate right, if not an obligation, to point that out and to show that if his argument is true, it absolutely nullifies all of the efforts made by all of his brethren in the past who have argued that instrumental music in worship is scriptural. Then he has also told us that divine authority for our practice is unnecessary. We do not have to have authority for what we do. And again, I say he may argue tonight inconsistently with that, because he is in the affirmative and may endeavor to show authority for his practice. But the first two nights, in endeavoring to reply to what I have presented, he has argued that worship is unregulated and that divine authority is unnecessary. And I have said, and I reiterate tonight, that he has rendered a service, one that will help all of my brethren who oppose the instrument to see that these brethren are much further down the road than many of us had realized. And I appreciate the fact that he's been as candid as he has because he has certainly let us know wherein he stands. Now, before I get to the matters that he has presented uh, this evening, I want to take a look at his proposition itself, and I would like to have chart number 25. We'll take a look at his proposition and see just exactly what is involved in it and what his obligations are. Here are the elements of Brother Blakely's proposition. Here it is word for word. The employment of instruments of music in the singing of praise, one, does not transgress the law of God, two, is harmonious with the faith of Christ, three, and is unoffensive to God. Then he has this word in there, hence, 
and it is used, as you will observe, in this proposition in the sense of therefore or consequently. That is, in view of the fact that he says it does not transgress the law, is harmonious with the faith, and is unoffensive to God, hence or therefore it is scriptural and in harmony with the Word of God. Now let me have uh, chart number 26, and I would like for us to see some of the obligations that are imposed upon him by his proposition. Number one, he must define the law of God. Now he's had something to say about that tonight, and we'll deal with that shortly. Two, he must show that the use of instruments does not transgress or go beyond such law. We'll see whether or not he's done that. Three, he must define the faith of Christ. He gave us a definition of that a few minutes ago, but I don't believe it's a biblical definition, and therefore we'll deal with his definition very shortly. Four, we must prove that the use of instruments and praise is harmonious with such faith. Five, he must define unoffensive to God, show how the use of the instrument falls within this category, and how does one know what offends God in this age? There is something that he did not deal with, and we'll see that more directly also. Six, he must demonstrate how the employment of such instruments is present tense. Now, let us not overlook the significance of the proposition that he's trying to affirm. And I'm going to say now, he did not affirm the proposition that he's trying to affirm. I noticed the wording of that proposition very carefully before I signed the negative of it. And I knew what he would have to do in order to affirm the proposition that he signed his name to affirm. And I confidently tell you tonight that he has not affirmed the proposition that he signed his name to affirm. And I believe that I'll be able to show that before we are through with this discussion. Demonstrate how the employment of such instruments is present tense, not was at some time in the past, not under some prior law, but how instruments in this age are scriptural and in harmony with the Word of God. Seven, he must explain what is meant by the singing of praise. He referred to that tonight, but he did not answer these questions. Is it authorized? Is it uh, worship? Is it not worship? I'd like for him to answer those for us and tell us what is involved in the singing of praise. Now, if it is authorized, tell us if it is authorized in the assembly. He said for two nights that it was not. Eight, what is meant by scriptural? He didn't say too much about that. Let me ask him, does this mean taught in the scriptures? Does this mean authorized by the scriptures? What constitutes a scriptural practice? He has that in his proposition. I believe he's obligated to give us some further information along this line. Nine, explain what is meant by transgress and tell how it is that one transgresses the law of God. And ten, show the difference, if any, in the expressions in his proposition, the law of God, the faith of Christ, the word of God, and scriptural. I'd like to know how he distinguishes those particular terms. Now, that gets before us his obligations under the proposition this evening. Now, I want to refer to the things that he's presented to us in his uh, first speech. But before I do so, I have a question that I would like to ask. Now, you understand that when I ask a question in the uh, address, I'm not requesting anyone in the audience to speak out. I'm asking for the sake of emphasis. I'm asking for the purpose of underscoring. But I want to ask this question now as I begin to deal with the matters that he's presented in his speech. Where is the passage of Scripture that Brother Blakely has given in the affirmation of his proposition in his first speech tonight that shows that he may use instrumental music in worship in this dispensation of time? Where is the passage? I submit to your consideration that if we were to dismiss right now and we were to leave this auditorium, and we were to go hence from this place, there is not a person here on either side of the issue or neutral on the issue who could go out and write down the passage of Scripture that Brother Blakely has given tonight that sustains the proposition that he assigned his name to affirm. Now, he said in our discussion tonight, he hoped that we could refrain from quotations from men as much as possible. But I want to say, my friends, that I'm dealing with a position here. I'm dealing with a position that has created division in the church of our Lord for nearly a century, or maybe more than a century now. And I am trying to show how that position has evolved. I'm trying to show how that Brother Blakely has forsaken the uh, position of those that have preceded him. In fact, he has not only forsaken, but he has repudiated. 
And there are men in this audience tonight on his side of the issue who have defended the uh, idea of instrumental music, whose positions have been repudiated by their own speaker in this debate. And I shall not be driven away from my obligation to show that this is the case. I do not have any desire to uh, embarrass these men, uh, not in the least. In fact, uh, many of the quotations that I have given from them, I gave because I agree with their statements along those particular lines. And because the statements they have made solidly disagree with the statements advocated by Brother Blakely in this debate. And I've referred a number of times to the uh, thought that I quoted Brother uh, Thomas Warren as an authority at some point. I hasten to add I did not do so and have never done so. What I quoted was a question that Brother Warren asked of Brother DeWell. And the man I was quoting was Brother DeWell. I was giving his answer. I did not cite Brother Warren as authority for anything. But I did point out that in answer to questions posed by Brother Warren, that Brother DeWell answered contrary to the position that Brother Blakely has taken in this debate. Because Brother DeWell said it is a true statement that we may do only that which the Bible authorizes. And Brother Blakely has said it is not necessary to have Bible authority. So I did not uh, cite Brother Warren, but rather the answer given by Brother DeWell. Then uh, he introduces his first chart tonight, number uh, 84, is worship or the knowledge of God preeminent? Well, that's simply a question. He did not make any argument on his chart. But he's asking whether or not the uh, knowledge of God or the worship of God is preeminent. Well, I'd like to point out in the first place how it is that we actually do know God. In uh, 1 John 2 and in verse 3, it is said, Hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And so that certainly involves the obligations that we have, and regardless of which is preeminent, there is an obligation that is involved for us to render obedience to what God has said. And I have argued here for the first two nights, and with very little response from Brother Blakely, that our worship must be in spirit and in truth. And for the purposes of this discussion, I have emphasized especially the latter part, that our worship is to be in truth. And again, I quoted from Brother DeWelt in his book, The Church of the Bible, in which he says that in truth means that it must be directed by and according to the truth. And I said that I agree with Brother DeWelt on that. And I think he's exactly right in his construction of what is meant along that line. And furthermore, Brother Blakely has not given any real response to that. But beyond that, in Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, the knowledge of God is associated with worship. When it is said, Now that after ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements wherein ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. And so the knowledge of God is certainly identified with the importance of worship toward God. Then is the next chart simply ask the question, does one who is a believer or one who is redeemed need to be instructed? Does he need to be instructed about worship? And again, Brother Blakely's idea is that if one is a saint or a child of God or a redeemed one, he does not need any instruction. He may just do what he pleases in worship. But the question here is not whether he needs to be, Brother Blakely, but whether he has been. And I pointed out again that in John 4, 24, worship is to be in spirit and in truth. I pointed out in Colossians 3 and verse 17 that we're to do all in the name of by the authority of the Lord. And by the way, uh, last night I could scarcely believe my ears. I had quoted Thayer's lexicon to show that uh, the name signifies the authority. I'd also quoted Acts 4 and verse 7. I'd also quoted Acts 2 and verse 38 for that proposition. And I noticed that Brother Blakely kept referring to Thayer as Brother Thayer. And I thought he was simply being facetious in doing so until he told us last evening that he did not know if Thayer was a member of the church or not, that he was not really familiar with Thayer. And I know that there are some in this audience uh, on his side of the proposition that cringed in embarrassment when he said that about one of the most eminent lexicographers of the New Testament Greek who has ever lived. This is not a commentary, as he suggested. It is the definition and the significance of the terminology as given by a Greek lexicographer. Then uh, 
He said, uh, is the instrument of music compatible with the knowledge of God? Well, how do we know God? By keeping his commandments. How do we know what the knowledge of God is? By what God has revealed to us in his truth. And if it is compatible, Brother Breaker, you ought to be able to show us some evidence of it from the word of God. I pointed out here earlier that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. Then I was amazed when he came to define what he meant by the law. He said that the instrument uh, is harmonious with the law, with the law of God, does not transgress the law of God. And then he went on to define the law as the law given by Moses. I must say in my wildest dreams, it never occurred to me that when Brother Blakely uh, submitted this proposition, that he had in mind by the law here a reference to the Mosaic law. And I was astonished tonight to hear him argue along that line. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 21, it is said that we are under law to Christ. In Romans 7 and verse 4, it is said that we are dead to the law by the body of Christ, that we might be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. But again, that signifies where he must go in order to find the authority that he desires. Let me have along that line chart number 16, and after that, chart number 16a. I'd just like to show basically what his argument is. He's saying, in effect, whatever was used in praising God in the Old Testament is approved for praising God today. And then instrumental music was used in praising God in the Old Testament. Therefore, instrumental music is approved for praising God today. That's basically his argument stated in uh, proper form. Now let's notice uh, this and ask him the question, will he accept the consequences of his own argument? God was praised in the Old Testament with the dance. Psalm uh, 149 and verse 3. He was praised in the Old Testament with the burning of incense. Exodus 30, verses 7 and 8. Burnt offerings were approved to God in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 6, uh, verses 17 and 18. Now, Brother Blakely, by what authority does one take one item and reject all others? We'd like you to deal with that when you come back this evening, since you've identified the law that is not transgressed by instrumental music as the mosaic law of all things. And then he talked about uh, the faith of Christ. He said uh, it is harmonious with the faith of Christ. And as best I can understand his definition tonight, he said the faith of Christ is a reference to Christ's sacrifice and that it does not uh, conflict with the great redemptive sacrifice that our Lord has made. But my friends, the word faith used in its objective sense is a reference to the gospel. In Jude verse 3, the uh, writer says, Contend earnestly for the faith once delivered unto the saints. There is the idea of the faith as it is biblically, and let him deal with that and show us from the faith where that he may find authority for the practice that he is defending tonight. And then further he says, it is unoffensive to God. We're not talking about whether it was unoffensive to God under the prior covenant. That's really all he argued. All he argued was to reach back to the Old Testament under which we're no longer our servants and said, why, here it was back here, could not be offensive to God. I want him to do what his proposition says. I want him to do what he signed his name to do. And what he signed his name to do was to deal with the present tense, not anything in his proposition that is past tense. His proposition is is. His proposition is now. His proposition is present tense. And let him deal with what he signed to do and what he agreed to do when he entered into this debate. And then he talked about uh, sin. And he said that uh, we must judge this matter by the biblical definition of sin. And although he did not develop his idea very fully this evening, I presume that what he's saying is that instrumental music is in no way a, uh, an act that fits into the definition of sin. You know, here's a statement that I've asked him about, I believe, every night. Uh, he's never commented on it. I don't think an evening has gone by that I have not pressed him about it, urged him to say something about it. Uh, he has not done so even to this good hour. I have on the chart over here that acceptable worship is inseparable from teaching and obeying the truth. He was talking tonight about the knowledge of God, whether it's preeminent over the worship of God, as though we could somehow uh, have plateaus of uh, importance in the affairs of God. But I have pointed out that the knowledge of God is inseparable to the truth and the knowledge of God. And I've urged him to deal with that. 
as we have proceeded from night to night, he's really said nothing about it. I have a very fine article here that is taken from uh, the Apostles' Doctrine, Volume 1, uh, the uh, issue of 1962, written by his father, Fred O. Blakely, in which uh, he speaks uh, rather definitively along this line. And I'd like to just refer to what he says again, to agree with him and not to disagree. He says, it seems that our Lord's teaching on the subject, he's talking about worship, is summarized in two of his well-known utterances. One, of the rebellious Jews, he exclaimed, in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men, Matthew 15, 9. Two, in that comprehensive definition of Christian worship, he declared to the woman at the well, the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, John 4, 23 and 24. Apostolic sentiment apropos of the topic is epitomized by Paul thus. Let no man beguile you of your reward and a voluntary humility in worshiping of angels after the commandments and doctrines of men. Colossians 2, verses 18 to 23. Then he says this. John summarizes, remember he's talking about worship, in these words. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. 2 John, verse 9. Now that is from Brother Fred Blakely. And I'd like to encourage Brother Given to come up here and uh, answer what his father has said along this line, because his father taught the truth on the matter here under consideration. And then furthermore, he said that uh, sin refers to that which is against God's nature. But bear in mind that God is truth. That is a part of God's nature. It is the essence of God's nature. And in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so you cannot deal with sin as that which is against God's nature without talking about how that sin is a violation of the truth of God. And then he said, well, there are no restraints Godward. He said all of the restraints had to do with the flesh. Outward, but not Godward. What about idolatry? What about idolatry? That didn't have to do with the flesh. That had to do with a Godward sin. And it certainly is restrained. What about Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2? Where did Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire upon the altar, which God commanded them not? These are matters that are involved in sins that were Godward, my friends. And this is something that he needs to deal with. And certainly what he needs to do is to come back and affirm his proposition. He has not given us the authority tonight. He has not given us the information tonight. That relates to the proposition that he signed his name to affirm. Now, I want to introduce this for your consideration as well. I want to point out that there have been many who have opposed instrumental music. You've read those quotations. I need not uh, recite them for you tonight. Many who are not identified with Churches of Christ. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, opposed instrumental music. John Calvin, the founder of Presbyterianism, opposed instrumental music. Adam Clark, one of the greatest Methodist commentators who ever lived. Uh, the old Baptist, according to David Benedict's history entitled 50 Years Among the Baptists, would as soon have tolerated the Pope of Rome in their pulpits as an organ in their galleries. Many of the famous leaders of the past have been in opposition to instrumental music, and yet I say to you quite candidly, I can understand tonight why the Methodists or the Presbyterians or the Baptists accept instrumental music today, because they do not have the same view of the scriptures that we have. But I want to see now chart number 10. We belong to what is sometimes called the Restoration Heritage, where that we believe the New Testament is our pattern and our authority. And I want to refer to a statement along that line made years ago by Brother J.W. McGarvey, one of the pioneers of the Restoration Movement. He said it is manifest that we cannot adopt the practice of using instrumental music without abandoning the obvious and only ground on which a restoration of primitive Christianity can be accomplished or on which the plea for it can be maintained. Such is my profound conviction, and consequently the question with me is not one concerning the choice or rejection of an expedient, but the maintenance or abandonment of a fundamental and necessary principle. I hold that the use of, instrumental, of the instrument is sinful, and I must not be requested to keep my mouth shut in the presence of sin, whether committed by a church or an individual. Apostolic Times, 1881. I raise these questions. One, how can we plead with others to give up doctrines and practices unknown to the New Testament if we ourselves adopt that for which there is no scriptural authority? Two, 
if it is our plea for people to come back to the New Testament and doctrine and practice, how can we call them back to a practice which is not in the New Testament? And three, how can we restore a practice which was not in the New Testament church? Is it possible to restore that which was never there? Thank you. And you, brothers and sisters in Christ, reviewed my proposition. I didn't see any words there in the past tense. They were does and is and is, and that's current tense as far as I know. My argument, <coughs> Brother Harris says, contradicts my predecessors. In all due respect to my predecessors, so what? We're here discussing whether my argument contradicts God, not my predecessors. Some of my predecessors' arguments probably contradicted their predecessors' argument. Now, I was alarmed at the comment that Brother Hires made about the faith of Christ. Of course, that phrase is taken from Scripture. I did mention that, found in Galatians, the second chapter. And verse 16 uses the faith of Jesus Christ there. Knowing that a man is justified, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The hallmark text, actually, of the new covenant and a great source of rejoicing for all those of us that realize we had sinned and come short of the glory of God and that the great work of redemption had been accomplished, in fact, by Jesus Christ. That's the faith I'm talking about, that justifying faith, the faith by which we are justified. We are justified by faith that that is the faith that the use of instrumental music does not uh, contradict, that it's harmonious with that. And I shall, as we progress, demonstrate that. Let's don't take the armor off yet, Brother Hires. We've got a couple of nights here to go yet, and it is too early to boast. Now, Brother Hires' analysis of my proposition and of the weighty responsibilities he has laid upon him, that, that's his problem, not mine. I know what I'm aiming at in the proposition, and that's what I shall deliver. And after we are through, you brethren can assess whether I have adequately met the proposition or not. Now, the knowledge of God, the interesting comments there. It is true, hereby we know that we know him because we keep his commandments. That's hereby we know that we know him. But the word of God tells us, it gives us the means by which we know him. In 1 John 5, 20, where he says, we know that the Son of God is. It is your particular advocate of the is and the was and so forth. I know you'll rejoice in that is. He is come and has given us an understanding that we might know him. That is true, and we are in him, that is true, even in his Son, Christ Jesus. This is the true God and everlasting life. That's the knowledge that I'm talking about there. It is evident to you as you walk in the commandments, how well I understand. I'm talking about the actual experiential knowledge of God, not the knowledge of the knowledge. Perhaps I should clarify this again. I believe it's chart 85. I believe Brother uh, Hires said that, I said that someone who is redeemed does not need to be instructed. So I will, I will go over this again and clarify this. That, of course, is not what I said. My statement was, does a person that knows the Lord, now I trust that's not unfamiliar language too, I may have assumed too much. I may have assumed too much. I had assumed that you are familiar, all of you, with the text of Scripture. That in the New Testament, which we have heard frequently used here tonight, quite unlike the Holy Spirit uses it, 
the New Testament church, the New Testament Christian. Now, the word is a scriptural word, but let's use it like the scripture uses. Uh, the New Testament or the New Covenant, which are synonymous terms in Hebrew, is the covenant in which they shall all know me. They shall all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness there, and their sins and their iniquities. Well, I remember no more. That new covenant or new testament is found in Hebrews the 8th chapter, verses 10 through 13. It's quoted from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. That's the new testament. What you've been calling the new testament is not the apostles' definition of the new testament. When Jesus said, this is the blood of the New Testament, he didn't mean this is the blood of the last 27 books of the Bible. Is there anyone here that wishes to affirm that? Jesus Christ is the mediator of the New Covenant. Is that the last 27 books of the Bible? Is there a person among us that wishes to affirm that? This is the covenant I will make, says the Lord. I'll put my law in their hearts. I'll write it in their minds. They'll be to me a God. I'll be to them a people. They'll all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I'll be merciful unto their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he has made the first old. That's the covenant I'm talking about that has the knowledge of God. Now my question was, does a person that knows the Lord in this covenantal sense, if you don't know what that means, go learn what it means. That's what Jesus said. He said, you go learn what it means. I'll have mercy and not sacrifice. There are some things cannot be communicated by speech. They have to be between a person and his God. If a person knows the Lord, does he need to be instructed on how to worship him in spirit and in truth? And if he does, then in what sense, pray tell, is God known? Because instructing a person in how to worship God in spirit and truth presumes a lack of familiarity with God. Now some, I, I will not even presume that any of you are unfamiliar with God. Such a, such a thought is a reproach. Because if any man have not the knowledge of God, it's a shame. That's what Paul said to the Corinthians, it's a shame. All men have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. He said, I trust there is nobody here tonight that does not know God. Not since Jesus Christ has ascended on high and led captivity captive, having destroyed him that had the power of death and had set down the right hand of God to receive eternal gifts for mankind. Not in this week should you be ignorant of God and unfamiliar of the knowledge of God and unaware of your heritage in him. It says the true worshipers, the time was coming, Jesus said. John 6, 23. I wish we'd deal with that verse. Instead of going to verse 24, I don't like the hind part reasoning of Scripture. You don't start with 24 and go to 23. Start with 23 and go to 24. It says the hour is coming. Bless God, it's here. It's here in Jesus Christ. The hour is coming when the true worshipers shall worship him in spirit. Well, I'm saying it's arrived. If you don't think it has arrived, you've got a controversy with the Lord of glory. Those in Christ Jesus are the true worshipers, and true worshipers can't worship falsely. If they are worshiping falsely, they're not true worshipers. <clears throat> now, you mentioned me referring to Brother Thayer. Well, but of, <laughs> but of course, uh, when you place such a great weight upon him, I naturally assumed he was a brother. I was glad to have it more uh, perfectly delineated, his his standing. I am, however, familiar with his writing. It's just that I don't equate them, Brother Harris, with the scripture. He lived too late. He's too distant from the apostles. And what his words are, are an interpretation of scripture. If they're not an interpretation of scripture, we don't need it. We already have the scripture. What do we need his word on what the scripture means for us? you must have a great admiration for Thayer. If we could just convince you to have that much admiration for God, wouldn't it be wonderful? Now you mentioned that we are under the law to Christ, but it is to Christ, not of Christ. The text doesn't say we're under the law of Christ, it says we're under the law to Christ, which is that great law of servitude. We are, of course, willing servants of Christ. 
that we are dead to the law through the body of Christ. And I might add, only through the body of Christ. It's only as you've been joined to the Lord that you're dead to the law. The law is still made for the lawless. And if you maintain I'm lawless, which you do, of all people, you should be affirming the contemporary nature of the law. The law is for the law. Incidentally, I am under no obligation to answer man's wisdom. Now, at this point, this is my own personal work. But I recognize a valid question only as a question, a, by a valid question. I mean a question that will be used as a basis of judgment upon me and upon my standing with God. I will not recognize such a question as valid unless God has asked. I will not permit you, Brother Hire, or any man or woman here, no matter how long standing you've been in the kingdom of God, you will not judge my standing before God by your question. I am a child of God and I'm a brother of Jesus. And I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and have believed the gospel. And God, my judge, who is able to save or to destroy, I will submit to God's interrogation. I will not submit to yours not as a matter of judgment. No restrictions Godward. It is good that we are discussing these subjects here because more is being evidenced in my position. <laughs> Idolatry is Godward. Why the word of God said that they offer it to devils or demons, not to God. Idolatry is demon word, Satan word. It's not Godward. <clears throat> As to J.W. McGarvey, for whom I have a great deal of admiration, however, he is, I have not thrust my soul into the keeping of J.W. McGarvey any more than I would expect him to place his soul in my hands. So his observations are good, and they are interesting, but they certainly are not binding, and I am not here to preach J.W. McGarvey. If you are, Surely you're not. Let's assume that you're not. Let's look at chart, chart number 52, the law. Now, I'm just using the law like the apostles used it. If you're unfamiliar with the apostles or you're uncomfortable with the apostles, remember, please, brethren, you who are prolific snickerers here, <laughs> and I'm afraid you give away your heart with your snicker, huh? Because if I was in your position, brother and sister snicker if I was in your position huh? and I believe the man that was talking to me was rejected by God and that his worship was rejected by God I'd be filling up the back here with a prayer meeting because God has said he has a desire for men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and heaven doesn't laugh when they think someone's out of order and the fact that you do disappoint the law was given by Moses. That's John said. I think that's pretty good authority. I accept you, John. You can hear us there in the other world. Thank you for the statement, John. By the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what the law of Christ, is that what that is? The law was given that every mouth might be stopped in all the world to come guilty before God. That's the law of Christ. Was the law of Christ given to stop every mouth? and make all the world guilty. Christ has delivered us from the curse of the law. No, that's the apostolic use, brother, of the word, of the word law. Now, I want to proceed with my uh, statement here, lest I be distracted over much by these uh, questions. Now, I've mentioned that sin is a transgression of the law. And I've identified what law it is. It's the law that came by Moses. It's the law by which God condemned the world. It's the law which God used to produce guilt. You cannot produce guilt in my soul with your law. You may be eloquent, and you may be formidable in your argument, but my conscience is responsive only to God, not to the laws of men. Now, I'm stating that the law of God, as I have defined it, is what defines sin, in this statement, sin is a transgression of the law. The apostles upbraided the early church 
for their sins and put them in remembrance of previous sins from which by the grace of God they've been delivered. Let me enumerate just a few of them. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 9 and 10. Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Every one of those were a transgression of the tables of the law. That's what they were. Sin is a transgression of the law. You will notice, of course, very carefully that sin of how people worship were not mentioned there. Now let's take another text, 1 Corinthians 5.11, which perhaps is a bit more appropriate here because we're talking about a brother here, someone who is in, uh, shall I be more precise, someone who is called a brother. 1 Corinthians 5.11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such as one not be. All infractions of the tables of the law, the law that was given, that every mouth might be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. Before God. I'm identifying how the apostles talked about sin. How they talked about sin being in particular the transgression of the law. I'm covering in this part of my speech one facet of sin, which is the transgression of the law. I'm dealing with the others later. Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 19 through 21, he enumerates, and surely there's no need to actually read these texts, the works of the flesh, and he uh, enumerates them as adultery and fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, and so forth. You are familiar with that list of sins. All of them violations of the law, as I have used it, of the tables of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. In Jesus' last appeal to the church, he told him uh, who was going to be excluded from the uh, world to come, as Paul calls it, Revelation, the 21st chapter, and verse 8, let the fearful and unbeliever and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All violations, transgressions of the law as I have defined it. None of these, you are very careful to observe, none of these had to do with an improper way of doing something right, which is a contradiction. You cannot do improper. What is right, if you do improperly, you've done wrong. And I think, as a matter of fact, I think we agree on that very, uh, very well. I do think we, that, that it's doing wrong. Is what, not, not doing wrong what's right, and you can't do wrong what's right. All of these had to do with things that were of themselves inherently wrong. You can't commit adultery right. It's wrong of itself. Now, my point is this. Don't miss it. That a use of instrumental music is wrong, it's wrong of itself. It's not because it violates this or violates that. Sin is wrong because of its nature, because it conflicts with God, because that's what the law is. It's a revelation of God. That's what he meant when he said, be holy, for I am holy. I am the one that's portrayed in this righteous, holy law. No, where are musical instruments pictured in this category at any time from the foundation of the world? In fact, they appear rather prominent in the world to come. I anticipate some things will be said about that, and I'm going to say some things about that too. Let me just uh, tantalize your mind. I will be dealing with that, and you can uh, think on these things. Now that James says, in James the second chapter in verse 9, referring to the law, if you please, uh, if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Now, he identifies the royal law just up there a little bit, which is nothing more than the divine summation of the latter part of the law. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. <laughs> That's the law. That's the law that, that encapsulated the commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. That was an encapsulation of the law which was given by Moses, which you, for some reason, uh, think could not apply to us. He says a person is convinced of the law as a transgressor. Now, may I say this, <coughs> that if the law, <coughs> and incidentally, you can read the law, matter of fact, you can read any law, 
I'm talking about the law as the apostles talked about it, but if you want to fix some other text of Scripture's law, read that. You can read it until the sun turns to darkness and the moon turns to blood, and it'll never convince the person that uses a musical instrument that it's sin. And if the law doesn't convince them, you can be sure, brother, you got your work cut out convincing me. Because I'm convinced of the law, of transgression, not of righteousness. I will not accept, of course, a hermeneutical principle as a basis for condemnation. The nail is too skinny to hold my soul. Now, there is nothing in the dialogue, by the deca nothing in the decalogue, uh, with which the uh, use of musical instrument clashes. I know this is true because according to Exodus, the 19th chapter, verses 13, 16, and 19, the law of God that was to condemn the world and make it guilty was given to the accompaniment of instrumental music. God Almighty did it. He gave his law that defined sin to the accompaniment of an instrument of music, the trumpet, which sounded loud. Now, it's inconceivable that the law of God, which was given to define sin, could be sounded to something antithetical to it. That which transgressed it cannot be sanctioned as an accompaniment to its revelation. Thank you. I'm happy to be back before you again now for a further denial of the proposition which has been read in your hearing and which Brother Blakely has obligated himself to affirm. I want to begin with chart number 28. We'll throw this chart up on the uh, screen, even though it is the same uh, chart in a little different form that I have uh, on the cloth chart on the uh, far side. This has to do with defenses of instrumental music. And I want to show you just how this has evolved and changed over a period of time and how far it has gone as we have heard these efforts presented this evening. A number of years ago, the uh, first argument that was made uh, with any degree of seriousness was that instrumental music is required by the Greek. O.E. Payne, in about 1920, put out a book along that line in which he says that the instrument inheres in solo and he stated that it is mandatory. Well, of course, that meant that you had to have it. And they did not stay with that position very long, even though uh, there was a great hue and cry about O.E. Payne's book. At that time, it was praised to the heavens. It was thought to be the final answer. They had at last established their proof for instrumental music in the worship. But then they realized that the consequences of that argument were undesirable. They didn't want to say that you had to have the instrument. They knew that Paul and Silas uh, likely did not have one in prison in Acts 16.25, and so they largely abandoned the idea that it was required by the Greek. So then they say, well, it is permitted by the Greek. J.B. Briney and Ira Boswell in the uh, 20 said, it is either with or without the instrument. They didn't want to say, as Payne did, that it is mandatory. So they said you can either have it or not have it. It's merely permitted by the Greek. Then uh, along in the 1950s, Burton W. Barber and Julian O. Hunt argued that it is primarily an aid, that it aids the individual. And they uh, endeavored to defend it on those grounds, and they uh, made no reference at all or scarcely any reference to the Greek at all. They abandoned that argument uh, for all practical purposes and argued that uh, it is merely an aid. And Barber especially said that it is not even in the worship. It's just an aid to the individual. And he tried to compare it to eyeglasses and walking canes and things of that kind. Then, uh, uh, long about 1985, Brother DeWelt uh, came out with this argument, uh, which incidentally was not new. I have references to it back in Restoration Literature uh, 50 to 75 years ago, but uh, it never was uh, valued too highly, and so it had not been heard for many, many years until it was resurrected here about uh, 1985. Uh, the congregational singing is unauthorized. And that was thought then to justify the use of instrumental music. I say this candidly because it is merely my own judgment in the matter that this is the weakest argument in defense of instrumental music that was ever devised by anyone until Brother Blakely came along. This idea is what I refer to as the you're another argument. It always makes me think of the two little boys that are arguing out by the back fence and one of them says to the other, you're a liar. The other one answers and says, you're another. 
Well, what that master is, he doesn't deny that he's a liar, but he just says you're one too. And so this is a you're another argument. These brethren are saying to us, well, it may be true that instrumental music is unauthorized, but you're another because congregational singing is not authorized either. And what they have failed to understand is that even if what they said were true, and it is not, you know, Brother Blakely tried to argue this the first two nights, never did understand that it had no relevance at all to the proposition. I told him one time that my proposition did not say a thing about the assembly. It did not say anything about a congregational gathering. He thought uh, by establishing that there's no congregational worship, there's no worship in the assembly, that he had done grand and wonderful things in behalf of his position. But it doesn't touch it. And this argument does not touch it because we do not merely say that uh, instrumental music is unauthorized in the assembly or that it is unauthorized in a congregational setting. We just say it is unauthorized in any worship, private or otherwise. We never have limited that to the assembly. And so even if this argument were true, it would not establish their position in the least. And yet they do not seem to have understood that this position does not help their cause. They still have to find that there is authority for the use of the instrument in a worship, whether it is private worship, public worship, congregational or otherwise. And yet this is another effort that has been made. Congregational singing unauthorized. Do you think anybody would have ever thought of such a thing had they not been trying to establish some point that they could not find otherwise in the Word of God? Then the disciples of Christ come along and they just say, well, it doesn't matter. And I read a quotation to you here the other night from one of the disciples of Christ ministers who said, we don't care whether they had instrumental music in the New Testament or not. We live now. And they said, we like it. And they said, furthermore, it puts us on a level with the uh, Methodists and the Baptists. Now, that's the way they look at it. The left-wing uh, liberal uh, disciples of Christ care nothing for the authority of Christ. And I submit that given old Blakely, has come closer to making the argument of the liberal disciples of Christ than any man in the Christian churches who has ever preceded him. He has presented an anti-law, anti-nomian, anti-obedience position in this debate from beginning to this good hour. That you do not need any regulation, you do not need any authority, you do not have to prove anything. And that is the position that he's occupied. Where is the scripture that justifies his practice? I said that in my first speech. I reiterate it now. He's had two speeches before us tonight in the affirmative. Do you know what he told us? He said, well, now, we've got two nights on this. I suppose that means that he's going to give us one. But I would have thought if he had it, he would have given it to this good audience in the very first address that he made. He still has not given it. And I predict he will not give it when this debate is over. And so now we have this position, Blakely's antinomianism, no authority needed, worship is not regulated. That's the position that he now maintains. Then he came before us a few minutes ago, he said, well, my proposition, uh, I've looked at it, and all of the words are in the present tense. I know that. I pointed that out to him. His proposition is in the present tense, but his arguments are not. That's the problem. His proposition says is, his arguments say was. And Brother Hardiman used to tell about going to look at a horse one time, and the man kept talking about this horse was a champion, this horse uh, was this, and he was that. And finally, Brother Hardiman stopped him, and he said, wait a minute, he said, I don't want a wuzzer, I want an izzer. <laughs> and I would say to Brother Blakely tonight, we don't want a wuzzer, we want an izzer. We want to know where is the authority for the use of the instruments of music in the worship of the New Testament church. And about 90% of the speeches that he has given tonight is utterly irrelevant to the proposition that he signed his name to defend. <laughs> And then he said, with a great flourish, and I noticed several of his folks like this, they amended. it. He said, what if I do contradict my predecessors? So what? He said, the real issue is here is what I say a contradiction 
of God. Well, I understand that. I recognize that. And I understand, Brother Blakely, that you are saying that what your position is tonight does not contradict God. I understand that. You tell me that. But I also understand that if you are right in your position, that what you say tonight does not contradict God, then it necessarily follows that what your predecessor said did contradict God. That's the point. There's not a way on this earth, my friend, that he can harmonize the position that he has taken in this debate with the position taken by his father in the excerpts that I have read from his writings there is not a way in this world that he can harmonize his position with those uh, taken by Brother DeWelt in public print. There is not a way in the world that he can harmonize his position with that which has been advocated by Dwayne Dunning in debates and in the public print. And I have pointed out and I continue to point out and I continue to urge and to insist that it is a legitimate point that if he is right in his defense of instrumental music, I don't believe he's right. I don't believe they're right. But I'm pointing out that the position that he's taking undermines theirs. And what it does in effect is admit to all of our brethren, for which I would like to thank you, that all of these efforts in the past were dismal failures. Because Brother Dunning affirmed that the New Testament authorizes the use of mechanical instruments of music in worship. And Brother Blakely told us on the first night of this debate that a good deal of the language in that proposition, although he didn't at that time refer it to that proposition, but he was talking about language that does appear in that proposition, is not only unscriptural but ungodly. Now, I know why that they're uncomfortable, and I understand why. <laughs> some of them amen when he said that uh, he would like to leave that off. They understand the consequences of this. They know that if his argument is right, that there's no regulation, there's no authority, and that none is needed, then the positions that they have affirmed and debate with those of us who oppose the instrument in the past have been not going to let them forget it. <coughs> then he referred to uh, faith in Galatians 2.19, the faith of Christ. That does not conflict at all with what I've said about what is involved in the faith of Christ. Remember this, the word faith is used in two senses, at least, subjective and objective. But when we speak about the faith of Christ, as in Jude 3, it is a reference to the gospel of Christ. But even if I were to accept his definition tonight, he hasn't proved anything about instrumental music. And then he talked about the knowledge of God in 1 John 5 and verse 20. But I pointed out in 1 John 3 and verse 2, the only way you can know that you have that knowledge is by obedience to God's command. Why does he fight against obedience? Why does he resist it when I give him a verse like that? Don't you see it's because he knows that he is not in obedience in regard to his practice that is under discussion tonight? Otherwise, why would he resist these passages? Why would he fight so hard against the definition of in truth? Did you hear him say anything about that tonight? in John 4 and he said let's go back to verse 23 he always wants to emphasize true worshipers he says there's the emphasis but who are the true worshipers they are those who worship in spirit and in truth he likes to leave that off and then uh, he constantly uh, condescends to the audience he said, perhaps I assumed too much. I assumed you knew the scripture. You remember he told us last evening that the reason that he made these arguments instead of the ones his brethren had made in the past was because uh, we could not understand them. I told him then, I understood uh, what some of them said a lot better than what he's endeavored to say in this debate. 
Then he talked about uh, Hebrews 8, the covenant. He said, they shall all know me. But how shall they know God? We've already seen that. God does not implant his laws uh, into someone's heart who is an unwilling subject, and in some miraculous manner, it is done by instruction, by teaching from the Word of God. He said there are some things that cannot be communicated by speech. Uh, I suppose that's like the uh, Pentecostal experience, a better felt than told. And then he said, uh, I do not equate uh, fear with Scripture. No one has said that we equate fear with Scripture, any other man with Scripture. But we do have to realize this, that when we're talking about Scripture, we're talking about words. We're talking about words which the Holy Spirit teaches. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 11 to 13. And if you're going to talk about words, and especially about words that were penned in Greek, it is necessary to understand the significance of those words. And that is all that is involved in referring to a lexicographer who has the same relationship to the uh, Greek language that a dictionary does to the English language. It is a study of the words in the period in which they were used, namely the New Testament period. And uh, it is simply anti-knowledge to suggest otherwise. And then he said, uh, when some of you expressed uh, perhaps some degree of amazement that he would disregard utterly what uh, an expert on the language would say, he said, well, you all really admire Thayer. I just wish you admired God as much as you do Thayer. Let me tell you something, Brother Blakely. You give us what God said on your proposition, and this audience will accept it. Amen. Give it to us. You haven't done it yet. And then he said, I'll not submit to your question. Well, I knew he didn't. I gave him questions up here on the chart about his proposition. He didn't say a word about them. And he tells me now, I'll not submit to your questions. I don't know if those are the questions that he had in mind or not. But I know that in 1 Peter 3 and uh, verse 15, it is said, Sanctify the Lord in your hearts as God, and be ready always to give an answer for the hope that lies within you, yet with meekness and fear. We could give an answer, Brother Blakely. And then he said, uh, Idolatry is not Godward. Let's remember the point he was making. What he was trying to say, if I understood him, and if not, he can correct me was that the statements that God made condemning sin had to do with the flesh that did not have to do with anything we offer toward God. If I have understood his part all the way along, and I don't know what the difference is, I have to confess, in one who knows God and one who is redeemed of God, he complained that I spoke about the redeemed of God, and he didn't mean that. He said on his chart, it said, one who knows God. Well, let's take his expression then. One who knows God, his position is he cannot offer wrong worship. One knows God, whatever he gives to God, God will accept. And in elaboration of that, he was saying, sin is not something that is offered Godward. And I said, what about idolatry? Because you see, that was not a sin of the flesh. That was not like these other things he talked about, adultery and so forth. That was a sin that related to what or whom they classified as God and worshiped as God. And that certainly is in conflict, in contradiction to what he said. Then he referred to Brother McGarvey. He said, I'm not here to preach J.W. McGarvey. Nobody suggested such. I cited a statement from Brother McGarvey that we cannot defend instrumental music without abandoning the very principle of the restoration plea. And on that chart, I gave Brother Blakely three questions to answer in regard to it. He talked about something that I did not even say. He implied something that I never stated, and he ignored what I actually said. And he did not deal with the questions presented. The fact of the matter is, all of us on both sides claim to believe in the restoration of New Testament Christianity. And my point is that if we're going to be true to that plea, there is a principle that is involved here that we're going to have to recognize. And I suggest that he's not doing. 
Then he talked about sin further. Uh, he went to uh, 1 Corinthians 6, where it talks about uh, such were some of you, and gives a number of the works of the flesh. Also in Galatians chapter 5. And he said, you cannot do a right thing wrong. But he has not yet shown us that instrumental music and the worship of the New Testament church is a right thing. And let me ask you this question. What does all of this mean? Why does he keep talking about sin? Why does he keep talking about the covenant? Why does he keep talking about the old law? Does it not become crystal clear that the reason why he emphasizes all of these things is because he does not have New Testament authority for his practice. If he had it, he could give it, and he would not be speaking about these other matters constantly. He said, you cannot convince me that instrumental music is wrong except by the law. Well, he's in the affirmative tonight. It's his duty to convince. I tried to convince for two nights, and he never even referred to what I have on the right-hand side of that chart. I show that instrumental music is not commanded, it's not by faith, it's not in the name of Christ, it's not a part of the doctrine of Christ, it's not in truth, does not come by hearing the word of God, it's not apostolic, was not practiced in the New Testament, it is not mentioned in New Testament worship, and it is not authorized. Now, he is in the affirmative, it's his duty to convince and to give us the authority for his practice. He says it is scriptural. Where's the scripture? Then he said instrumental music does not contradict the Decalogue. Well, that's the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath does not contradict the Decalogue. Brother Blakely, you willing to give in to the Adventists? The same one. 